So, um, getting through the words of institution, hopefully we'll get through them today. Any questions to start us off today? Yeah, Merle. Myself and several other people noticed this morning that when we don't sing a letter G, we forget a lot of the words. Isn't that amazing? Yeah, but that's why I reference page numbers more often. Yeah, that's a good job there. Because, uh, yes, I, I agree. And when it came time to the Create Me a Clean Heart of God, as I had to leave my hymnal and go take care of the offering, I'm sitting there going, Oh, yeah. I can sing this, but, yeah. So, um, Merle's referencing that during our service today, uh, we're doing uh, just one hymn, the hymn of the day, and we're doing spoken liturgy. Um, that was my judgment call, so that's that's on me, if you like it or not. Um, our hospital's overwhelmed, so um, that's that's basically the word I'm getting from the hospital and those who work at the hospital, is that the hospital's overwhelmed, and so little things we can do to help, that would probably be a good thing. So, uh, if nothing else, for the health of everyone, but also for the health and well-being of our hospital workers, so, who are working a lot of extra hours. So, yeah. Yes, but not singing does all of a sudden bring it back to memory that, man, I memorized this while singing it. If it's not set to a tune, I'm not sure I can say it. I, I even have that, had that trouble, trouble today with, like, the benediction. It's in there going, okay. Just about grab the hymnal to bring it with you. But, yeah. Indeed. Other questions today before we get into the words of institution? Yeah, Bill. Do we have some changes to be made because of what the governor is coming down with that we have to do with our services? Um, we do not have any changes we have to make. Um, the governor's decree, which happens on the 24th, I think it is, uh, exempts churches and uh, faith activities, I think is the word that they use. Um, so we're exempted. Now, government does that, of course, because of our religious freedom. Um, but the scriptures teach us to use our freedom wisely. Um, and so the, the elders, I think, are... We're, Pastor Bakey and I are discussing things. We'll probably throw some things around with the elders. Like I said at the end of the service, uh, for sure we're going to add a couple services for the midweeks. Um, we'll do a 7 o'clock and noon. Um, so 7 o'clock at night, but then also noon during that same day. Uh, to allow for members to uh, spread out a little bit more between services. The, uh, the noon service will not have an organist, so that will cut back on whether we sing the liturgy or just speak it. Um, that's what I know so far, but what, more will be coming. I mean, um, Saturday we're going to do a delivery, and in that delivery I would expect, God willing, we'll have a letter from the pastors put together, something that kind of spells out how we're going to try to do Advent and Christmas. Now in Colorado, the governor is coming on with some mandates to the people. Yeah. Yeah. And the pastor said, we have to obey God rather than man. Yeah, um, which is true. Uh, back in May, when our governor's orders, uh, was like the fourth, I think the fourth continuation order, uh, that's the one that actually spelled out how we had to do communion and stuff. And at that point, yes. Um, now, we'll do communion the way that God says to do communion, not the way that our governor says. Now, he heard that rebuke and he removed all that language, and that's from that point forward, um, they've actually spelled out churches being exempt from these orders. So, in that respect, our governor has been respectful. He crossed the line, he was notified of that, and he backed away. Other states are having much more difficulty in that respect. Um, Pastors in California and, and places like Michigan are definitely having to just essentially break the law, but realizing that they're keeping you know what God says to do while breaking the laws of men, which is what the church is given to do in these times when the government when the government 
oversteps and starts commanding things that they have no duty to command. Is that the church does have the duty then to disobey. Now the pastor brought out that us as human beings are social creatures and that we need to interact with each other and if we don't we get bad results. He brought yeah. out that the uh, suicide rate is thicker than going up extremely high because of the close down with the virus. consequences that, you know, which are valid, I mean, the whole increase in suicidal rates and so forth, um, is, is the very word in the New Testament for church means gathered ones, uh, collected ones, ecclesia, called out together. And, and of course, St. Paul, uh, well, the author of the Hebrews says, you know, let us not forsake the gathering together as some have done. Okay, so, so we don't want to forsake that. We don't want to leave that behind. Um, because the church is meant to be a, a group of people. And, and it's very bad for a Christian to be isolated and alone. Um, just ask those who persecute the church. That's one of the things they seek to do, is take Christians and isolate them. Um, and so while we have that freedom to gather, we, we, we make exercise of it. And... Uh, should they ever decide that they should force us not to, that would be a different issue. Then we are in an Acts 5 situation of obeying God rather than men. So, uh, it's, it's funny because uh, in, in researching the hymn for the week, the Philip Nikolai hymn, it talks about how Nikolai, of course, uh, as I mentioned in the sermon, he buried 1,400 of his 2,400 parishioners um, that year. Um, but it also then talks about how he was using... Uh, certain incenses, absinthe, um, various other things to mitigate the plague. You know, he was, he was trying to use the medical knowledge of the time to offset it. So, uh, by, by the end, I think he was the only remaining Lutheran pastor in the town. The rest have died. So, um, just how it goes. And it's uh, unpleasant to think about, but... As Bill just reminded us, as St. Paul reminds us, you know, absent from the body, present with the Lord. Um, St. Paul says, you know, it's, it's better for me to go and be with Christ, but for your sake, it's better for me to remain and be with you, he says. Chet? Yeah, I, I was reading some of the during the play, they uh, talk about the medical things at the time. They, they surrounded the Pope with fire. <laughs> <laughs> they had him set somewhere and they set fires all around. You know what they should have done? They should have gotten UVC bulbs that would have taken care of <laughs> Yeah, there's, I mean, again, you use that wisdom of this earth as best you can. And if this has proven anything, um, I mean, I, I know that this has created a whole group of people who, quote unquote, trust the science. Uh, 
but what this has really shown us is that science, um, as it is developing, is not all that trustworthy. No, it changes every two weeks. It changes. It and, changes and so, every two uh, weeks, so why pay attention to it? Well, <laughs> because, because it's wisdom of this world. And, and in earthly matters, there is a wisdom of this world. And so we do try to pay attention to it. And, and I think it, it has revealed to us that we, we thought science was kind of like almost this infallible thing. And what we're seeing is true science, which is, it's changing. That they're seeing different things. And so they, I mean, don't forget the scientific method. What is it basically? Trial and error. That's what we're seeing. So, um, which is why it appears like it's always changing, but in reality, science is just doing what science always does, which is, let's try this. Oh, I produced these results. Okay, let's try this. But, but so. what the problem is, people say it's fact. It's not, it's, it's well, not, that's the underlying idolatry of it. Yeah, it's a fact. It's, it's the, it's the underlying it's trust in science, which... Um, science has things that are trustworthy. Those are called laws. You know, and so those they are, are the, the, like gravity and those kind of things. I mean, they are facts. Right, that is fact. He is equal but, but that's fact. Right. But most of what we're seeing now is, is they're, they're trying to use science, theory. They're but theories. it's a lot of theories, and they're trying to yeah. weigh things up. So, um, you just have to keep things properly in mindset on that, that things are ever-changing. Bill? We go back to 1918 and 1919. Yeah. We had the Spanish flu. Mm -hmm. And in Cheyenne. There were 128 deaths, which is about 10% of the population. Yeah. The population of China was like 12,000. Right. Now, if you go to 2020, we find that our population is about six times as much. So if the virus isn't as is bad as what it was in the Spanish flu, we have about 750 deaths here. Right. And in fact, the number of deaths we have is about 20. Yeah, for, for way less. Yeah. So, if you get this, uh, the virus, you've got about a 99% chance of surviving. 1% mm -hmm. from dying. Now, you can take those statistics for whatever you want. Sure. That's science. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> the conclusions are still out, out there. I mean, um, certain death rates, sure. Um, certain survival rates, and then there's certain like side effects and long-lasting effects rates. But yeah, um, when when we changed things in April, the, the goal was at least according to our government to, to quote unquote make it easier on our healthcare system. And so now that our healthcare system is being taxed, it's wise to to maybe think about some changes um, because finally our health system is being taxed. Yeah, like I said, um, folks that work in NCRMC and the VA are saying they're very, very much swamped. So, yeah. All right, on to things that are heavenly and more eternal, uh, trustworthy rather than scientific. Um, we, last week we covered this. We were into the words of institution in the Lord's Supper, and we got this to that He gave it to the disciples. When we started talking about closed communion, specifically how um, Jesus here is giving the example and giving it to his disciples of closed communion, that the public confession of everyone there uh, is the confession of Jesus, uh, that all the disciples agree publicly. And yet we know one of them, particularly Judas, uh, had uh, of course been overtaken by the devil. And so that Jesus here, even though he reads and knows hearts, he teaches us who can't read and know hearts uh, about close communion. And we use the, the public profession, uh, which usually boils down to church membership. And, and so that's what we talked about last week. Um, disciples are made by being baptized and taught to observe all things that Christ commanded. This is why we have confirmation classes, why we have new member classes. These kind of things, to, to teach people. 
uh, specifically what Christ has commanded and what, what the doctrine of the scriptures is. So, all right, so moving on in that first half of the words of institution, so he, he gives it to the disciples and said, um, we, we, we too often just breeze past these words, which is a bad thing. Um, this is one of the greatest advantages to when you read it in, a, in another language like Greek. It forces you to slow it down because, frankly put, you know, you can read English and you just read some through things. But you read Greek and you're kind of like, okay, what's that word again? Oh, yeah, okay, and then this word, yeah, it slows you down, okay? So we're trying to do that as we go through the word institution here, even in English. And said, uh, we just breeze through that word, but yet that word, said, that the God said something is, is, is crucial to this. That Jesus is speaking, the disciples are listening, they are hearers. But here's the introduction to the command. Um, the efficacy of God's word to do what it says. This is what we teach our children when we teach Genesis 1. You know, and God said, let there be light. Guess what? There's light. And God said, this is my body. What does that mean? This is my body. Okay? And when God speaks, all of creation lines up to what God says. And this is the foundation of what we believe about the Lord's Supper. Is this belief we have in the efficacy, the power of God's Word to do exactly what God's Word says. Take, eat. The bread is to be eaten. It is not to be stored up or taken home or anything else but eaten. That is the purpose of the distribution, that is, the breaking and giving. Whether the bread is to be taken by the hand or the mouth is not specified, but it is to be taken and to be eaten. Okay? Uh, this is over and against uh, the, the Roman Catholic doctrine of saving it up and putting it in a monstrance and, and adoring it or leading it in Corpus Christi parades uh, through town and so forth. No, Jesus tells us what to do with the sacrament. This is my body, eat it. Okay? Don't hold on to it, don't go home with it, um, don't worship it, eat it. Okay? Very, very basic command. Take it, eat it. Now, this the hand or the mouth, um, by hand, uh, you, you have to interpret as a beggar, okay? Because when we come to the Lord's Supper, we are beggars, right? This is God's gracious gift to us. And so the extending of the hand is essentially uh, like a beggar asking for something, okay? But on the other side, you'll see some folks who want to receive the sacrament, the body of Christ, on their tongue. And, and for that, what the confession is, of course, is that this is the holy body of Christ. It does not need to be in my unclean hands. Just place it into my mouth. Either way, the body of Christ has been taken and eaten. Okay? That's the command of Jesus. Okay? This. Jesus is referring to the bread, which is being distributed so that it can be eaten. It seems silly to make notice of this. But there are some churches who nowadays are saying that Jesus, when he says this, he's referring to his body. So he's handing out the bread and then he's saying, oh yeah, this is my body. As if he's teaching like a kindergarten lesson or something like that. I, I don't understand. Um, but he's referring to this, refers to the bread that is the body. Okay? Um, is. Contrary to previous presidents, is means is. Okay? Um, it's just, there's no other way to interpret it. It's not symbolic. It's not representative. He says is. He means is. And because he says it, we get into this efficacy stuff. That he says it is, it must be. Um, just like let there be light meant there's light. This is my body means this is my body. <coughs> Uh, my, not someone else's, but the body of, going back to our beginning of the words of institution, our Lord Jesus Christ. That is, ours by faith, 
Lord God, Jesus, the God who saves Christ, the, the God who saves the one who is appointed for the salvation of many. So that's my. It's all wrapped up into that one pronoun. And then body. Not another thing. Not the blood. Specifically because he will address the blood in a second. But instead the body of Jesus. The same body that's crucified on uh, the very next day. That body. And this is a mystery. And it, it's not meant to be fully explained. It's not meant to be fully understood. But yet he says it, so it must be so. Uh, this is... He that is worthy and well prepared is he who believes these words. Okay? Not he who knows or understands these words. But he who believes these words. This is my body, the words of promise. The bread is Christ's body. That symbol. Which is given for you. Um, again, Christ is the giver. He's always giving. He's always giving these gifts. He's the giver, and yet, in this case, he's also the gift. Okay. Um, he's giving himself. The body of Christ is given. For you is the personal promise. So again, this is as Luther says, for the words for you require all hearts to believe. And so when he says for you, that is the invitation of God himself for you to believe it, not just in general, like, oh yes, yes, that is true, that Jesus' body is there <laughs> But it's that Jesus' body is there for me. Um, that, that for you is his invitation for you to believe this individually for yourself. Okay? Because it, it, the devil can sit there and say the objective things. But it takes the Christian to take those objective truths and apply them to himself. Yeah, Merle. Not quite. Um, obviously, other Lutheran bodies do as well. Um, Wisconsin Synod, Norwegians, uh, and the ELS would agree that it is Christ's body and blood. Roman Catholic and Greek Orthodox churches both would say it is his body, it is his blood. Um, Roman Catholics would deny that it's still bread and still wine. Uh, they still hold to the whole idea of transubstantiation, that is, the substance itself changes. Okay. Um, but, but Lutherans have remained with, with 1 Corinthians 10, where St. Paul still refers to it as bread and as, as wine or the cup. And so we go, well, even Scripture still calls it bread, and yet also calls it body. So we don't know how that is other than he said. So we go with that. But ELCA, I would draw into question just because they are in full communion with church bodies that absolutely their official doctrine is that it's representative, that it's not actually there, um, that, that so forth. And that's, I mean, that goes all the way back to Reformation time. The Reformed, uh, which is first of all Zwingli, and then secondly becomes John Calvin, and then all the Presbyterian and Reformed churches that break off from him, they all officially believe that it's not actually there. So when, when the Lutherans in 1580 to 1590 start visiting their parishes as, as Lutheran and Catholic were the only legal religions in the land, they would ask the question of the preachers and of those they examined, uh, the preachers would ask this question of those they examined and communed, what is it I hold in my hand and what is it you receive in your mouth? And the Lutheran answer was of course the body and blood of Jesus. The Reformed could never say that. And that's how they tried to smoke out the Reformed, so to speak. Um, because the Reformed would say that it's, it's just bread, it's just wine, or later grape juice. Um, and they would have all kinds of strange notions about that, including um, how, how the Christian ascends into heaven and there spiritually dines on the ascended Christ. But again, that's not the picture of salvation that our Lord has painted in Scripture. That if salvation's coming, it's coming to us. It's not us going to get it. It's God bringing it to us. Uh, 
And it's just, it's a strange application of John chapter 6. If I'm going up there to get it, why would I want to come back here? Well, <laughs> there is that, but there's also the fact that without Christ, you're not going to get it. Nope. You're not going to get there. So, um, but yeah, it's a good question. Because there are a lot of churches that confess that it represents, symbolizes it's not actually there. And in their church's cases, they're right. It's not there. That they're having snack time. So, Dave. Can we call people that don't agree with this, uh, with us on this? Can they still be called Christians? Yeah. Um, the common ordinary ones, yes. But, but when you get into like pastors and, and the teachers of the faith, there has to be a little bit different standard applied. Uh, because they're actively teaching false doctrine. And, and if they're presented with the truth of God's word and they reject it, that's a different thing. Now the common Methodist, the common uh, Baptist, whatever, um, Reformed person that, that goes to their Reformed church, listens to the word of God, um, doesn't have the sacrament of the altar, falsely taught about the sacrament of the altar, um, I would still count them as Christians. Uh, but this is the danger, is that every little bit of false doctrine that you accept, and this is a pretty hefty bit of false doctrine, because it's denying you the sacrament of the altar, of Jesus' very clear words. Um, every bit of that false doctrine has the potential to destroy faith. Right? Jesus' words about leaven, Leavening the whole lump. Um, that every bit of false teaching leads you away from Jesus. And if you think about the whole representative symbolic language, it absolutely leads you away from Jesus. This is Jesus speaking. This is my body. And the preacher that goes out and tells his people, well, Jesus doesn't really mean that. Well, what then does Jesus mean? And where else does Jesus say things that he doesn't really mean? You see how that starts taking root? And, and, and so, does Jesus really mean that, I'm the only, that he's the only way, truth, and life? Or is he just using rhetoric there to get a point across? Uh, all the doubts that can start creeping in, and then of course the doubts then start to rot away at the foundation of faith. Because doubt is the enemy of faith. And so that's, that's the danger here. Not that they can't be Christian, but they're accepting things which can ruin their Christianity really quick. Um, and so it's good to engage them on these things and talk to them. Not, not in mean-spiritedness, by any means, but, but actually out of love for them, that they would hear the shepherd's voice and, and go with what Jesus is saying. Chuck? So, so why, way back... It doesn't make sense, is what their argument would be. Correct. Um, the Reformed churches, uh, for, for John Calvin, everything had to make sense. Okay? Uh, the man hated uh, mystery. He hated things that kind of had to hang in tension. That the tension between statements always had to be resolved for him. And so they come up with all kinds of things like, you know, all God gives us our understanding, it's part of the image of God, and so forth, so everything should be understandable. Which is not what Scripture says. I mean, Scripture calls things mysteries. In fact, it calls pastors the stewards of the mysteries of God. That, that there are things of the Gospels that are just not understand, understood. I mean, when St. Paul says this of husbands and wives, that I speak of the mystery of Christ and his church. You know, that there, there's something mysterious behind it, which most likely means that it won't always be grasped by human reason. Uh, but, but those churches from the, from the outset were, were churches where things ought to be reasonable. And that was one of the guiding principles, was that it had to be understood, it had to be reasoned. 
And, and so it is unreasonable to understand that Christ's body somehow is there. And then that Christ's body is not only there in that wafer of bread, but then over at Trinity at the same time. And then over at King of Glory at the same time. And over in Utah at the same time. Or over in Texas at the same time. You know, that, that Christ's body could be on a thousand altars at the same time. Makes no sense whatsoever. Okay? This is why when John Calvin gets to the Easter account of Jesus in the upper room with his disciples, he says that Jesus must have found a second, uh, since the doors were locked or the fears for the Jews, that Jesus found a, a window and snuck in through a window. That was John Calvin's explanation. Right? Whereas the scripture just says what? Jesus appeared in the midst of them. In his flesh, because he's like, here, touch, see. But yet, this is our Lord. He, he's now in his state of exaltation, in his body, which he will never be without now. Since he took up residence in, in the Virgin Mary's womb, he will never be without flesh. But in that flesh, he is still true God. And now, after he has died and paid everything he needs to pay uh, for our salvation, he fully uses his divine power and authority, which then, of course, means that in that flesh, he is fully, truly God, and can do fully, truly godly things. Like show up on a thousand altars at the same time. See, that, that's just the way it is. But for someone who's trying to think this through, it will not make sense. And so therefore, it needs to be questioned. And it needs to be now. And then you run to the scriptures and you find places like John chapter 6, and that's where Zwingli ran in, 15, in the late 1520s. And he tried to explain this kind of spiritual presence of Jesus in the sacrament of the altar. Um, which is only part of the picture. Our confessions talk about there is a spiritual eating of Jesus, and it happens by faith. Uh, but that's not the sacramental eating of Jesus. The sacramental eating of Jesus involves, yes, faith, but it also involves you taking and eating and drinking of it, all of you. So, yeah, it, that's where they go, is right to reason, to the mind. Chad? Yeah, you know how you say that it's hard to understand, but as a well, Calvin, the opposed really understand scripture and all that. He knows yeah. that, that Christ is divine, basically, can be anywhere he wants. And, like, Because in the end, Calvin's, Calvin's main norm is human reason. Rather than the word of God, right. his main norm is human reason. Well, if you, if you read scripture, you're supposed to be indoctrinated in scripture. How can you even think like that? <laughs> that see, to me, that's, that's, I mean, you say you can't be human reasoning. I can't reason quite good. Like that. Yeah. This is the trick we have when we watch movies that the secular media makes about Christmas stories or Easter stories. Is we, we hear them and we see them as Lutherans. We're, we're just like, oh yeah, okay. Uh, which is kind of its own blessing in that you know, we, we've so embraced the teachings of Scripture that when we see something that's even false, we interpret it in the right way. Uh, which is a great blessing. But, uh, yeah, I, this Philip Nikolai, the, the the author of today's hymn of the day, uh, Wake Awake, he was a strong, he was known uh, in his time, in his lifetime, as being one of the chief uh, debaters with the Calvinists over these things. And, uh, yeah. Because the trick is, is that in 1555, you have the Peace of Augsburg, and, and that declares that the Roman Catholic and Lutheran religions are the only legally allowed religions in the land. Throughout Europe. And you have all these Calvinists 
and, and they can't be Calvinists, legally speaking. And so they, what do they do? They, well, they don't want to be Roman Catholics, so they all say they're Lutherans, and then the Lutherans have to sort that out, which we do. I think so. if you try to make sense out of it, forget it. it it's like fairy tale. I mean, From the start of Scripture, how are you going to make sense out of let there be light and there was light? None of us have that power. Any of you create anything by just saying it? Right? I know many fathers would have loved to create things like disciplined children and so forth just by saying it. But it doesn't work. It doesn't work. It doesn't work that way. Well, when God, of course, it does work that way. It's God. But yeah, there's just things in the faith that we just don't fully understand. That, that's okay. It doesn't have to all resolve itself in a nice uh, mental picture. Well, if you try to rationalize the whole story, it's like a fairy tale. Well, and we've seen history um, of, of rationalism, which is a movement, which tried to explain everything rationally. And what happened was, of course, you ended up with a bunch of non-Christians who attended church to hear nice moral tales of how to be moral or how to properly farm. Uh, I don't know how you do that because when you hear this parable of the sower, it's certainly not a wise farmer who throws seed on the road. But that's how it goes. But that, and rationalism tried to do that, tried to say all these parables, yeah, that Jesus is just trying to teach good, moral, and wonderful lessons, uh, rational lessons. And that's not what he's doing with parables at all. Um, okay. Well, I have a trouble seeing how Cal uh, people that truly believe that Calvin was right, how can they accept Christ rising from the dead? <laughs> they can't. If well, they're going to rationalize it. This is why you see so much effort being put into proofs of Christ's resurrection. I'm not saying that's a bad thing. I mean, it's, it's good to go back in history and see that you know, there are historical writers who talk about the resurrection of Jesus happening and so forth. And there's good logical arguments like why on earth would the disciples, the apostles, go to their deaths in the way they did if they knew it was a lie? You know, if they knew that Christ hadn't been raised, why would they go die for it? Uh, okay, those are logic and it's history, fine. But, but the truth of the matter is the scriptures say it and so we believe it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's some of that insistence upon... Um, Making it reasonable. Yeah. It's dangerous stuff because the, the the error, the chief error between behind thinking that things have to be reasonable is an error of um, original sin. Not understanding what original sin has actually done. Uh, because original sin wrecked our minds. This is this is why when Adam and Eve sinned. They go and hide from God in the shrubs. Because they've lost. Just all of their mental faculties are so dulled at that point that they think they can hide from God in the bushes. Right? They, they, their mental faculties are so dulled, and yet they, they know they're naked for the first time, and so they have this shame and so forth. But their mental faculties are so dulled that they think that fig leaves are going to cover it. The fig leaf underwear is the best kind you can make. Right? Um, God proves that wrong. He creates animal skins for them by killing the animal to cover their shame, um, foreshadowing the killing of Christ. Um, but that's yeah. It's it's a it's an error of understanding just how bad original sin is. That it not only renders us spiritually dead. Um, and, and and enemies of God, as it even says in Romans. Uh, but it also dulls and corrupts even our natural faculties, our stuff in this life, our ability to think, our ability to reason. Um, and that original sin has, has dulled that. So, to make reason the final arbiter of God's word is, is to deny what original sin has done. Yeah, Merle. I think when we have our doubts, it's not like we all do. Yeah. By our own reason or strength, we can't do it. 
I believe that I cannot by my own reason or strength believe in Jesus Christ my Lord or come to Him. Which if you take out all the extra words, I mean, it says this. I believe that I cannot believe. Can't do it ourselves. Right? But it's the Holy Spirit who calls me by the gospel might be with His gifts. Right? So yeah, this is all, all God's work, um, which is the point of the sermon today. Um, is not that we sustain our faith, but that God does. And He's chosen certain things to sustain that faith. And so if we're uh, good and godly folks, we will understand that God has promised things around the Word and the sacrament, and those that are the things we find ourselves around, the Word and sacrament. Because we know God has said things about these things. And He's promised to do things through these things. And so therefore, I want to be around these things, so that God may work in me through them. And that's how you become a wise virgin. Um, with oil. At, at the return of our Lord. Okay. This do. Um, <laughs> it seems so silly to have to explain simple phrases like this. But don't do something else. Stick to things as he has already done them. And you'll have the sure sacrament. Um, do this. Okay? In remembrance of me. Um, here we're pointed to what Jesus would do for all the very next day. Christ and the supper. Not just the person of Christ, but the thing that he has done. The work of Christ as well. Salvation achieved for all. In the supper we get to receive this in a very personal way, a pledge of that forgiveness and that salvation that he earns the very next day. Remembrance then is tied up in faith or trust in what Christ has done. Okay? Trust in his work of salvation. St. Paul writes that when we partake in the sacrament, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. That's, that's 1 Corinthians where he talks about that. Um, and he speaks of this in a plural, which is why the sacrament of the altar is a congregational, communal thing. Um, common confession of faith at the altar, this proclamation of the Lord's death until he comes. Uh, notice it has his past work, but also then faith in his promise. Uh, he's, he's coming. And Advent is, of course, the perfect season because we celebrate how he comes now, how he comes uh, how he's promised to come at the end of all things. But then, of course, then we finally end up with this Christmas season where we hear of how he's already come in his first coming as, as the infant of Bethlehem. Okay. So the common confession, that's a close communion connection there as well. That the disciples all confess the same faith. That was their public confession. Uh, and they would remember Jesus the same way. Okay. Remembrance in this sense also has kind of the sense of, of Old Testament remembrance meant observance. You did it. Okay, so it's tied to this do. Um, the remembrance as well is, is this do. You do this. Okay? Um, it's all tied up in that. Um, many Aryan church bodies will focus in on these words. And in fact, a lot of Reformed altars, and I use that in quotes because they wouldn't call them altars. That's too sacrificial. Um, they, would, they would call them tables or whatever. In fact, a lot of Reformed tables have that in remembrance of me as their focus. Um, because again, that has to do with our actions again, which is the subtle error in Reformed theology is it usually pins everything back on per, a, a person's actions their own works, and so forth. Whereas, whereas the scriptures would have us, yes, this do in remembrance of me, that there is a remembrance of Christ, who he is, what he's done, and what he's instituted, and what we're doing in the sacrament. You know, what, what it is we're receiving, what it is he's doing to us. And that's important. Okay. All right, questions? Bill? Bill? Yeah. And just what does that mean? We have this very sinned churches that are having their full attendance and the pastor will say, if you are a Christian <laughs> and you are a sinner and you want God's forgiveness, you are welcome to come to our <coughs> sacrament. And I believe we don't look at them as being closed. That's right. 
That's not the open. And yet they will respond and say, we are keeping the unbelievers and the unrepentant come to our service. So we are practicing close communion. Yeah. So um, where does false doctrine fit into the Ten Commandments? So say, for instance, you don't believe it's actually Christ's body and blood. Which commandment are you breaking when you believe that? Well, first commandment, ultimately, because you usually break one of the other commandments, and then you break the first. But the second commandment, the worst violation, the worst misuse of God's name is to have false doctrine. That is, you teach something false, but you slap Jesus' name on it just to make it look right. So when you say that it's not Christ's body or blood, this is just one example, you are taking something false, and you're slapping Jesus' name on it. And that is a sin. Second commandment. Now, those who are in sin, not those who have sins, but those who are in sins, living in them, now we're in an issue of, should they have communion? If they resolve to stay in those sins? And the answer is no. This is why, you know, when the pastors find out members are shacking up together without being married or stuff like that, guess what? If we can't get them to resolve things in, in a repentant and Christian manner, we ask them to refrain from the Lord's Supper. Because they're stuck in impenitent sin. So similarly, when I have a Methodist come and ask for the sacrament of the altar, as they are Methodist, the public confession of the Methodist Church is, it's only representative, it's not actually Christ's body and blood. I have an issue I need to deal with with them before I can commune them. And so, faithfully speaking, am I best off saying, never mind, just here, have it all, we're going to treat you just like everybody else? Or is it more loving to say, until we figure this out, you can't have this. And the, and the reason it's more loving to say you can't have this right now is because of what Jesus warns, or what the Spirit warns through St. Paul, about wrongly communing. And so as a tool of pastoral care, communion is only meant for members and certain members at that, because there's even some members who may not be able to partake of communion. And, and those pastors who have open communion, or functionally open communion, or however word you want, how, everyone explain it, they have erred. And, and as pastors are held to a higher standard, they have bigger issues coming. Um, because they're, they're unfaithful in their calling. And our Lord does not take that nicely. Um, so, uh, again, closed comes, the word closed itself comes from the fact that they actually excused people before having the sacrament. That anyone who was not going to have the sacrament was exited from the building, and they closed and locked the doors. And that's where the word closed comes from. But it comes from the teaching of Jesus, that this is meant for only those who have been baptized and taught all things. And someone who believes error has not been taught all things. Because they're believing error. And so it's the loving thing to do, to hold them apart until that error can be resolved. Many cases they don't want the error to be resolved. Many cases they just want to hold to their error. Just how it goes. Yeah. I've heard it say close, and I've heard it say close. Yeah. What's the difference? Close comes in um, at a time, I think, of when people are trying to make close communion more friendly. Close can be okay, as long as it means the same practice in the end. Um, but in a lot of ways, it was always an effort to try to be nicer. Um, yeah, to try to find some middle way. Um, close is meant to emphasize the closeness uh, that is supposed to be there between Christians. Um, yeah, it, it's semantics. It's English wordplay. Let's just go with close. That's what the other church used, and that's fine. It, it is all how we explain it. So, I mean, my first parish, um, they liked close communion because they had a pastor who really 
stressed closeness and so forth. So um, I was fine with that as long as we meant the same thing. But really, let's, let's just call it close. Call it good. That's, that's more clear. So. All right, let's join in prayer. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we give you thanks that you've given us your only begotten Son, and that your Son has instituted, ordained, that the sacrament of the altar be done amongst us, that our faith would be strengthened, our love would be increased uh, by such a sacrament. We ask that you always keep us faithful to your Son's words of institution, that you would allow us to faithfully use and make use of the sacrament for the strengthening of our faith, the increase of our love. We ask that you would bring those who err in regards to your sacrament to repentance. That they would come to believe what your word actually says. We ask all this as we ask for your mercy upon all of us. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.